Hey my lovelies, how are you doing today? If this filming looks a little different but you remember it from somewhere, it's because I'm filming with my phone this time. I um, wanted to go to the beach for Easter weekend because I wanted to just pull away and be with the Lord. I just had this desire to just be with the Lord. So I was going to film this at the beach, but because I didn't bring my camera, I didn't want it to be too noisy, hard to set up. It was already hard to set up in the hotel, so I could just imagine how it was gonna be at the beach. So please excuse the mess in the back um, because we're just getting ready to go. We're just kind of getting ourselves ready. But um, I just wanted to get on and tell you a word of encouragement for Easter, give you my Easter message this year. My Easter message this year is a little different than what it's been for Christmas and for Easter in the past few years. I'm going to use this opportunity to answer a, a follower, a subscriber rather, that asked for my testimony. And uh, it was, I love that when that happens to me because when that happens, when someone asks me of something of me that I, it's not easy to give, it challenges me. It makes me um, have to, just want to see what things look like back there. <laughs> I think it looks okay. Um, it makes me have to really think. And um, I wanted to share with you my testimony. And I wanted to be spirit led because I actually have a lot of testimonies. Um, I feel like I'm a living miracle. And it's I, I don't share my story very often because there's so much to share and there's so many small parts in my life that are when other people share their big moments and their thing that changed their lives that's like one of my little things sometimes and so it makes me feel like I don't know where I fit in with the whole you know sharing my story and you know from whence I've come and all that my story is very unique in that sense that it would make a I've made someone cry by just telling them a piece of my story. And so it makes me not know how much can I share? I mean, am I allowed to share mine even though mine is uh, really heavy, you know? It's made me who I am today and those of whom love me, this young lady, this woman loves me and loves what I stand for and wanted to really know how did you get there? And she knows what, she, what she's asking. She's asking spiritually, how did you get to where you are? And so I'm going to attempt to give you the biggest thing that made me who I am today as a, a follower of Christ. Um, and it would take a series, like literally, you know how like Roots had a series? It would take that to really tell my full story. But when I really thought about it, I was trying to think about what would I tell people? What would I tell people? I I really was able to say, okay, my pivotal moment. I remember going to church once in um, a church in Georgia, and I don't remember the pastor's name, but the church was called My Church. And so, if you're listening from that church, you know, I'm calling and giving you a shout out. And I remember him doing a whole series on the pivotal moment. So, that's where I got that term from, and that's what I'm going to do here. Um, those of whom have received Jesus as their Savior, you know what I mean when I say sold out. And when I talk about the, the time in my life when I know the Lord pulled me through and, and it changed me forever. That's what I mean by that. When I say pivotal moment in a spiritual sense. Just to give you a clarity on what I believe about salvation is that you become saved. You receive Jesus as your Savior. And then you, um, the next step is to fully surrender to God fully surrender your life to the Holy Spirit and live for him and so you don't do things your way you do things his way you live in an obedient state so I when people say what's your testimony usually they mean when did you get saved how did you come to know the Lord how did you go from dead and sin and living for the Lord and where you are today um, I'm gonna I'm going to share with you the first time someone asked me that and how important that was for me and that's later on in the in this video okay the first time but that question was how did you come to know the Lord tell me your testimony but when I got this one I don't think that's what she was asking she already knows I'm saved and that I've received Jesus as a savior I think what 
and if you're listening, please comment down below if this, if I'm correct. I think what she's saying, how did you get to where you, as deep in the Lord as you are today, having the joy that you have and that contagious joy? I've been hearing a lot of people with that message. Uh, so I'm going to answer both, okay? So it all started, um, I thought I received Jesus as my Savior at 16, but I read an old letter my mother wrote. And when I really think about it, it was 15. So for some reason in my mind, I remember it being 16, but I think it's because I was almost 16. But anyway, I received Jesus as my savior at 15. And um, I can tell that story, you know, one day. But I grew up in a home that I believe was dark. And the biggest problem with the home that I grew up in, and I have notes here because I, like I said, I have so much that I have to keep it as tight as possible. So I grew up in a home with toxic people. Everyone basically was toxic. Um, now my sisters and I, there were uh, two sets. So it was uh, two sets of children, I should say. My mom had three girls, so we grew up together. And then later she had uh, a, another girl. But I was about 12 by the time she had that next set of children, which was only just one child. Okay, so she, the youngest one, didn't really experience some of the things that I'm talking about until the end of the story so basically I'm just gonna get right into my story because I don't really think there's a set way to do this so just be bear with me and um, I hope that you're blessed with my story okay my testimony so basically I grew up in a home that was extremely educated uh, but especially I grew up in the 70s and um, those of whom have been following me you know I'm 40, 40 ish <laughs> and um, um, so in that time, my parents were very much of activists in their own right, um, and they were hippies, but back then, black hippies were smoking marijuana a lot of times, but they were extremely educated as well, and so I have highly educated parents, and they knew about the black struggle, and they were just really smart people. My father was, uh, as far as I understand, he was a party starter. He would always... As you can tell, I got it from somewhere. He started parties. I was really excited. My mom was very beautiful. And um, I think you, if I can give you a vision of what she was, she looked a lot like uh, Beyonce um, and Tina Turner. When she got older, she started looking like Tina Turner or Beyonce's mom. Uh, my father, I can't think of somebody he looked like. Hmm. I, don't, I can't think of a famous person he looks like. But, you know, he, so... I don't know if it matters, but she was fair skinned. He was darker brown skinned. And back in those days, that that mattered, you know. But the way they raised me, they did not raise me to, to focus on complexion or color or any of that. That's the truth. So psychologically and mentally and all that, I was not raised in that kind of mindset. So I felt like I was always free and I was very, uh, you know, open-minded in that way. However, I was really, really aware of, the struggle, the black struggle, and um, all of that. So there's that. So I figured I wanted to say some of that there. And there was also, uh, just like everywhere else in America, there was drug use because they, they smoked marijuana. Um, my mother was a PK. My grandmother was a preacher. And she, I believe, might have been um, a first-generation um, uh, American. I'm not sure, but I think either her grandmother or her parents might have been slaves. Um, from Africa because she carried a lot of the African traditions um, and she did her hair with the um, she did uh, banding what do you call it threading she threaded her hair all the time she didn't do it to, for her children and everybody else but she did it herself she would make things that were very different the foods and everything and she okay so the whole story about her is that she had a slam in body she had a beautiful body and beautiful complexion very very dark beautiful, beautiful woman. And her husband was very fair. He was like Native American, Irish, fair man. And his mom was, did not want, had, all of his sisters and mom had long, long Indian hair. And try to give you a little background uh, before I tell you about the dark stuff. <laughs> Didn't accept my grandma, but my grandfather said, well, then you don't accept me. And he loved her so much. They had uh, 10 children. So I have a lot of brothers, uncles and aunts and everything. My mother was the baby of all of them. And my grandmother was known for being the preacher of the area. I don't know if she was very keen on voodoo, but she was always preaching against it. She was a healer. She healed people through uh, uh, prayer and salvation. Uh, she was a preacher and kept the, she was like the pillar of the community. Okay. So that's, 
kind of what I came from. All I know is my, I know my mother's side of family more than anything. My mother and father met when they were very young, I think 14 and 15, grew up together. And their relationship from all I can see from my perspective was always volatile, always in my opinion. In my opinion, I feel like they were always competitive with each other. I don't understand my mom very much and I'm still trying to, but she left the home and she was the baby, remember, of like 10 siblings. She went to New York to visit after uh, to visit her big sister, and her big sister was into tarot cards and voodoo and things like that. And my mom learned from her. Uh, this is a story that I understand. I now re I remember her being proud of being good at reading cards. Um, and so, but she must have kept a lot from me because I don't know a lot, but I just know enough to know that today I know enough. I put enough together to know that she was definitely. I believe a witch and so um, growing up though I didn't know that so but when I got close to her sister which is my aunt my, my mother figure later on because my mother denounced me later on in life but um, she didn't want me to be her daughter anymore but growing up she treated me differently you know and yeah I was a middle child the first set because I was the oldest I'm the second oldest and then there was the younger one then later we had another baby uh, we all felt like that was our baby. You know, you can imagine th three girls, older girls with a little one, we all were like the mom, you know? So um, I felt like my mom was an absentee mom in a lot of ways because of the marijuana and just kind of locking herself in the room. I think she probably had some depression. Who knows what was going on now that I look back. But growing up, I grew up in a lot of abuse. And my aunt says it's because of the voodoo. My mom, my aunt claims that when a woman did voodoo to get a man, the man is always angry and he fights back. So if anybody's listening, you might understand. This is so hard to share with you all. So hard. Because I grew up um, where I was supposed to keep everything a secret. And we had one of those families where we had to keep a smile and have everything perfect on the outside and keep all these secrets on the inside, including abuse. My father abused my mom physically most of my life, my youth, my life. My sisters and I, I felt, were very close because we needed each other to deal with the pain of listening to my mom get beat up. So our, my mom's wall and my wall, we met at that, uh, we shared the same wall. So we would be laughing and having fun and then we'd hear thumps and we knew what was going on. And then we all kind of together knew mommy was being beat up by my dad. My dad, let me just give you a good picture, wasn't very tall or anything, but he was, a, I think, a featherweight boxer. He dibbled and dabbled in boxing. So I know he was very strong. And I mean, I have, I'm just naturally muscular. I don't even have to, I do not train or anything. I take after my father. I have muscles because naturally. If I wanted to be a bodybuilder, I probably could do it. Cause I just get muscles very easily. So I got it after my father, very, very muscular man, very strong, um, small frame, middle to lightweight. If he's listening, he knows I might be making a mistake with some of that, but he definitely was into boxing. So just think about that. My mom was beat up to a pulp on a regular basis. This is the 70s, guys, so you know back then the policemen would laugh when they come in and be chummy with my father. It was a regular thing. I remember having the door. My father was just uh, like a walking demon. He was impossible. He, he was just impossible, you know? And so she would get beat up all the time. She was beating the head. Her, he, she was so pretty. Uh, back then, I think a lot of men were trying to make those beautiful women, especially the light-skinned women, uh, they tried to make them ugly by hitting them in the face. And so to make her, I don't know, there was just a psychological issue with that, I guess. So she was beat in the face a lot. And I remember saving her life once from my father trying to kill her. She was passing out. And that's a story that I don't want to get into detail with, but... Um, that was actually, I think, the last big fight they had. I was, it might have been 14 or 15 then. And uh, I believe say, I saved her life by helping her get away from my father because I was sitting there watching him uh, strangle her and she was passing out. So there's that. And so years and years and years of her being beat up. Um, and then when she used to, they smoked marijuana together, but then he went away and they weren't together and she was with someone else and the little baby was from someone else, a person she was with that she loved. And so we were happy to have this baby and then they ended up not being together anymore, the guy she was with. 
and um, my father came back. And so he took this baby on as his child. And to this day, I think she considers him her father. And um, so my sisters and I always knew this awful life we were living. My older sister, um, uh, my father, there was some kind of uh, molestation going on, incest, some kind of incest. The lot, it's very vague because I feel like I was kept away from a lot of things because I think they saw me as being different. I'm not sure why, but there was some kind of tampering, they call it, where he touched her or something happened there. That put a wedge between my daughter, my big sister and my mom. And then my mom and my dad didn't treat her right. And I stood up for my, my sister a lot because I loved her so much, my big sister. And I was scared of my mom. So, but I stood up for my sister. So that's the, the story. Where I fit in this is that um, the family didn't like my father, obviously, and I was actually browner skinned and he was too. And this only matters if you're not of the black community. Back then, color was a huge deal. It still is now, but back then, people just treated each other really differently based on that. So, but in my home, I wasn't raised that way so when I saw something outside where someone treated me a certain way I really couldn't put two and two together as to why they were doing it because I truly wasn't raised with that in the house so um, they always told me I was beautiful so this is the story of me I was always told I was beautiful I was always told I was talented my sisters and the family just knew I was the talented one I was the brilliant one I was the one that was gonna be famous I was the one that could just do anything everything I touched turned to gold I was just amazing and everything that I did and this is how I was raised like honestly really smart men Math. I was just like amazing and all this stuff and I think personally it taught me that if I'm gonna get love I need to be the best so it made me an overachiever I believe in some ways and a people pleaser in that way and it just kind of started this whole thing with me and then uh, we were all educated and I was the first to go to college of course and all this stuff so I had that going on and then I had abuse my mom beat me more than anybody else I got whippings I feel like almost every day um, according to her I was hard-headed I was you know the one she beat all the time so when I tell the story before I, when I was preparing to tell the story I said to myself okay so daddy beat her and she beat me I think that might have been her way of getting back on him because everyone said I look like him that I reminded everybody of him honestly guys I think it was just the color because I guess my ways were like him too, but as I get older, I feel like I look like my mom a lot. You know, if you could just get past the browner skin, I felt like I ended up being more like her. So, but, but as time went on, I realized I have the best of both of them in me. I chose to bring out the best in my mom and what she had going for her, this brilliant woman, very intelligent woman. She was a teacher, very smart. My father, bright, sharp. They're both just smart people. But sometimes you could be too smart for your own good. So basically, um, that my mother beat me and whipped me on a regular basis all the time. It wasn't just crazy beating. It was more of a very, very structured. She would just say, my, my, I joke about it now. She says, prepare yourself. Uh, if my sisters are listening, they know exactly what I mean. Because they got whippings too. But I definitely, even though we don't talk right now, they have to agree that I got all the I got most of the whippings. <laughs> my sister had some very bad abuse because of that whole triangle of my father, my mother, and her. She got a different type of abuse. And she, you know, her life was affected in that way. But for some reason, I was just whipped all the time. She always gave me whippings all the time. She said I was hard-headed, maybe I was. And when I look back, I was uh, very creative. You know, I was always, I was very, very creative. I was always thinking of things like, you guys know me. So I think that she just didn't um, know how to deal with a creative, smart, you know, outgoing, you know, young, a child, you know, because I was never malice. Because at the same time, she said, I used to give things away all the time. I was so loved, I always gave things away. But somehow when she told her story about me, it was always like negative. And then when I talk to my aunt, she doesn't say it that way. She says, you were always praying. And I'm like, wow, that makes sense because I pray a lot now. So I've learned a lot about myself by talking to my aunt because she said it without any of the stuff behind it. So there's always been something with my mom and me. And with all of us, I always felt different. I almost felt like I was adopted sometimes because I was always punished and just weird. And, and I was just very spiritual. I always loved the Lord. There was a lot of things that I didn't agree with that the family was doing growing up. And I just never understood why do I feel so different? So not that I didn't do things wrong, just like my sisters and all of us did, you know, sex before marriage, I definitely did that. You know, and I didn't like that. And I had terrible things happen from that, of course. That would be my biggest sin, you know, and being, because I, I mean, as I got 
cuter. I had a beautiful body and you know, it took me a while to kind of have a body. <laughs> but when I did, I usually, I had a slam body, slamming body compared to anybody around, you know, it just stood out. My figure stood out always. I won awards and stuff from it. And I don't know, but I think that didn't help my situation. So my grandmother had an amazing body. My, both of my grandmothers, my father's mom and my mom, grandmother my mother's mom they both were very dark complexion with amazing figures and so I think I might have pulled from both of them you know that muscular thing so I'm older now but I I definitely am blessed in that way I'm really blessed to have that so um and then I had the big gift of my grandma loved dancing watching uh soul train even though she was a preacher she used to love watching soul train so that might me maybe she was a dancer in her heart because I dance now so anyway that's the background when my father came back, he left and came back, he brought home cocaine, which introduced cocaine to, to us. We never knew what that was. I think that was in the late 80s or something. Then it turned into crack, and then both of my parents were started to use them, these highly intelligent people. And I think it kind of really destroyed our, our home. And uh, my sisters and I were just still trying to pull it together. So my sisters and I also noticed that my mom's her and her sisters didn't get along. And... Um, I always felt that there was like some kind of curse on my mom's family or something because it was just dark all the time. We just couldn't get joy, joy in the family. So my sisters and I made a pact that we would never be like my mom and her sisters. We'd always be close. And that's, and we were very serious about that. And then later on, as my mom, um, came out of all this, I remember when that last time when I, uh, saved my mom, they were both taken to the hospital and she had cuffs on her because she had to um uh, it's i don't even want to share it anyway she had to do something to my father to get away she had to take a kitchen knife and stab him in order to get away right and um she did but it didn't hurt him the, the knife never did hurt him but she got away and she lived and I don't know if they call that blacking out when you're high or drunk or whatever. And today he considers it being blacked out. Um, but she definitely would have died before my eyes because I was watching her and she was completely passed out. So when they got there, she had cuffs when she was in the bed because of that. But it turns out that she was fine in self-defense. And he was only focused on her doing that, which is an abuser. So if you ever want to know about abuse and abusers, I can definitely help you with that because now I'm a kind of an expert on abusers and toxic people. I can help you stay away from them. That's what this is really about. So um, I had my boyfriend at that time, my first love. When I say sex before marriage, I was with him for like so many years. We were like a married couple. And um, he was there. He came and helped me and everything. And I was like my little sister's mom because my sisters were in North Carolina and she was like my mother, my child, my youngest sister. And when my other sisters were here, she, it was like, she was like their child. We would do everything. My mom was kind of absentee with her a lot because we were, we just came in, swarmed in and took care of her a lot. Um, she was there, but not hands on like we were. So um, until later when we all left the house and she had to be. So, but she had her hands full because look what she was dealing with. So um, when that ended, it ended, I think, finally. They ended up ending it. And she was so badly beat up that she couldn't work and her, she was deformed, her face was a mess. So you guys do the math. With drugs, having crack come into her life, through my father introducing it to her, and then she actually did it. She was already doing um, marijuana and freebase, I think they call it, when you put something in there. And then uh, that came along and she was scared. And I loved her for one day, she did it in front of me and my sister and said, don't ever do this. If anybody ever do, tells, introduces this to you, they're your enemy. She did that in front of my sister and, my, and me, my younger sister and me, because it was my older sister that she claims helped her do it. I don't know. I don't understand the story, but she, uh, she encouraged her to do it or something like that. Because back then, no one knew how bad crack was. Um, but anyway, that was my mom loving us, trying to love us. So then I thought, okay. This is all happening and the world thinks we're this great family outside and this is how we were raised to be and we had to keep that secret we had to if they knew my mom got beat because that was a regular thing back in the 70s 80s you know and that my the neighborhood knew that but they didn't know all this awful stuff i don't think that was going on in the house my mom was like a queen bee and she was just like you know i'm perfect she always said she was perfect she always wanted to be perfect and she always made us feel like she was and we she was like a god to us 
literally. And I don't know if I took it more than them, but she was like, my God, I have to be honest. So I was saved at 15, but the reason why it took me forever to be sold out is because I already had a God, my mom. She raised us to have her be like our God. Everything she said was bond and we didn't question it. Of course, inside I was questioning things, you, you know, but she was everything to us. So she showed love in those ways when she can come out of stuff. So you can imagine how hard her life was, but she brought a lot of the darkness in her life. So uh, even with all this going on, I believe my mother has been doing voodoo, but she wouldn't tell me because I was very, my sister, I'll tell you what I was based on what my sister said I was, because it would sound funny if I said it. But we were at a family reunion once and my sister tells my cousin, she says, isn't she so pure? And I just thought that was odd to hear my older sister, the one I adored, I always adored, and she said I was pure. And I thought, I, can't, I see what she's talking about because I have this loving heart and all that stuff. But it was an interesting comment, especially because I always felt like I was not with, I felt like an, uh, uh, um, an orphan. I just didn't feel like I belonged. And I never knew why, I never felt peace in my home. I was always at my best friend's home downstairs that uh, spoke Spanish and her mom was like a mother to me. I always stayed there. I felt more comfortable like it was more of a home to me. Um, I always stayed in other people's houses. Now back in the 70s and 80s, kids went out and you didn't have to worry. And I was in a, in a neighborhood that had eventually turned into a very Hispanically, a lot of Hispanic people. They always let me in, I always ate their food. So that's where I learned the Latin dancing, the Dominican, all of that because it, they were like my family. So my culture is a Hispanic culture mixed in with the African American culture because of that. But growing up, I always wondered, why do I always want to be somewhere else? I was always in somebody else's house. I was always wanting to be somewhere else. And I just didn't feel right in my spirit at home. I feel like later on, when I talked to my aunt and other people, my mom was doing voodoo. She was not just a tarot card reader. I remember though her, I remember overhearing her once talking about how she broke a couple up. Like she was so good, I guess, that they hired her, her and my dad. My dad tries to pretend he was never a part of this, but I remember this, he, had, he knew about it too, is that she literally did voodoo to break a couple up. And she, she was saying it in front of me, talking to somebody, I don't know what she was talking to, but she never said stuff like that in front of me, but I remember that, and I remember her feeling bad about it. And or she, she was around other people because everybody thought they had a great relationship. So I'm here to tell you, it really is real out there, guys. People are trying to get your life. If you're wondering why you're sick, you're wondering why your relationship's not working, that's real. You know, it took, I was so naive and my mom was such a god to me. I never wanted to believe this stuff, but, um, I'm leading, I'm building this background for you to lead you to when I became a young woman and went to college. My relationship with my mom just got worse in its own way. It turned into a relationship where she was competing with me almost. And for some reason, I thought I was getting along with my sisters, but that didn't, wasn't going so well either. My mom basically came between my sisters and I, but I'm gonna tell you something, excuse me, because I'm not editing this. I today realized that she didn't do it, they allowed it. The jealousy was already in their hearts and the desire to do whatever my mom wanted, it was already there. Because my mom has dementia now and is not, not able to do anything and they're still doing it. And you could just put, can you do the math as to why she might have early set, onset dementia? You're being beaten in the head on a regular basis. You're using marijuana and then you start using, uh, you free, free base with the, with the um, marijuana, meaning putting traces of cocaine, I believe that's what that is. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I've, because of this, stayed away from drugs by any means necessary. It just was something that uh, I grew up in Washington Heights, New York City, and I was around so much drugs. It was like Night of the Living Dead. You would see these high-level people just, uh, these moms. I remember this little boy we watched, and she was like, like my mom, just put together African-American, beautiful woman, gone because of crack. It just was such a horrible thing to watch. I, I remember in school they were showing us this drug thing and I had to walk out. It made me sick to my stomach. I literally was traumatized by all this drug use that I grew up with. It was just awful, 70s and 80s. So I was afraid of even drinking a glass of wine. I, was, I went to college and all the rich, I have to say white people, kids were passing out drinking like all you see is people either drinking smoking weed or getting high and it's just like I just couldn't take it so I would not talk to a guy that ever did that I couldn't be around people that were like that I just couldn't deal with it right so I grew up I set out to grow up and say I'm not gonna be with a man that beats me or uses any drugs 
that was it, right? So I met a guy that also felt that way. This is the sad part. He came from toxic people. So I grew up with toxic people. He grew up with toxic people. Controlling mom, insecure. The basis of her, of her controllingness, it comes from, if there's a word, controllingness, insecurities. So did his mom. Just dominating, trying to tell us what to do. All the siblings. And the siblings don't treat each other right because we have to do what the moms say. He came from the same thing. So we had that relate. We could relate. He was able to help me. But guess what we did? Just think about that. We get married and he loved, he was Catholic and he was Christian. So I thought, okay, I'm equally yoked. Because I didn't know what unequally yoked or equally yoked means. Comment below if you want me to help you understand what equally yoked means. I'll do a whole video on it as a Christian. So I thought I was. We got together. Um, he was Italian, and I'm African American, and our children were, we just loved each other, and it's a beautiful story, comment below if you want me to tell you that whole story. And what we did to our children was that we brought two toxic families together for these two beautiful children. And now they have no family, because they're too toxic for, for my children to deal with. So what ended up happening is we both knew that we were with toxic family members. I didn't, I couldn't articulate that then, but we both were trying to get away from these crazy families and have our little family. I think both families had a jealousy of that. We were trying to get away from this craziness, but we didn't even know what it was. We were so like trying to figure it out. So, but what was happening is if we didn't grow ourselves, we would bring that toxicity into our own lives. He wasn't really saved, born again. He was a Catholic person that reached church, church went to church and he loved it. I was saved, but I hadn't been sold out yet. But I was pulling away from my family, trying to come up with my new way. He was um, had his Catholic beliefs and things that he would never do. I had my beliefs of what I wouldn't. We put it together, and it made us who we are. We had our issues. That's a whole story by itself. But that's one thing we had in common. We did not want the craziness that we came from. I don't think he was able to break his. I was educated, and he wasn't. Um, he was a blue-collar worker. He worked with his hands, excellent cook and all that. But when we got together, as I grew, because I was 14 years younger than him, he became jealous of my growth. The reason I loved him is because he didn't have jealousy in him. He was just this guy, this brute guy that was strong, didn't care about what I had, all the accolades. I had all these degrees and stuff, and he didn't care. He just liked me. He loved me. He loved this black woman that was so beautiful, that he, whatever. And he had his issues, and yes, there was racism in his family, really bad. And we, I was young, so I thought I could do tackle anything, so I did it. But it, I reached a point. Now I'm getting to the point of my pivotal moment. I re when I got married to him, my mother started to come after me in a mean way. She started to lie to the family about me. She started to start rumors. She started to try to separate me and my sisters and say I did things to them that I didn't do. Anything I did do, they tried to pretend I had a motive behind it. In fact, to this day, that is our issue. I can do say I love you. They would write all kinds of things saying she said it funny. In fact, that actually happened. Um, um, that, that's literally something that actually happened and stopped us from talking to each other. My father, believe it or not, ended up later on being somebody who helped me understand abuse. The abuser in my loan, my, the primary abuser in my life was the one that helped me get away from my abuser. Okay. So my mother abused me in her way and then started teaching my sisters on how to be mean to me too, which was already in their heart because years have passed. This was way when I was in my 20s and I'm in my 40s and they're still the same. So obviously it's in their heart to be that way. But I'm with my husband and I start, I say to myself, okay, I'm going to go out there and work for my family. He's going to be at his decline while I'm going up. I'm working and I'm this overachiever and this beauty that you can imagine me in my 20s or whatever, I end up getting a new person that comes in the thing in the mix which is a, a supervisor that is loves me but once I get to the school I was a teacher I taught Spanish I have a lot had a lot of degrees by that point I had a master's an undergraduate in dance and theater and English literature and then I had a master's in um, then another degree in Spanish and then a master's in education secondary education and I was going towards getting a um, but later after this pivotal incident pivotal moment is when I went back and got um, a postmasters in superintendent and, per, and being a principal. So a lot of schooling. My mom was a teacher, an excellent teacher, and I think I went that path. So, and in New York, it just never ends because you get paid more the more schooling you do. So I have all that going for me, more than any of my sisters in terms of education. And so the little one, the little one, we wanted to be a doctor. She's brilliant in every way. Okay. Well, anyway. She, she, we put everything in her because she was amazing. She still is, and she's a doctor today. But anyway, um, 
So we're together and my mom starts to treat me bad. She gets jealous of me because it's almost like I'm doing things right. So she told me all these things of what I should be as a woman. And all those years she told me the right things verbally but lived the wrong way. And as I was in my 20s, I started seeing that. I was like, wow, my mom taught me to be what I am today. I took it to heart. She said it, but her life is nowhere near what she told me to be. And I think she started noticing that I was noticing that. And I think she started coming after me and trying to tell all the family lies about me. And it was just awful, guys awful so here I am for the first time with my daughter my husband and I'm like not knowing what to do with my mom and I still love them I'm obsessively loving my family I would cry my poor husband had to deal with it every Saturday I was crying on the phone for hours begging her to love me my sisters begging them to help me because they were closer didn't know my sisters were not my friends either I didn't realize that because we have been through so much so finally I get this job teaching at this place where this woman's fighting to have me I never had I never had student teaching so she hires me and then when she hires me, um, you can see what I mean by the pivotal moment is kind of hard because you have to tell the background. Um, she hires me and without student teaching and saying, don't worry, I'll put her under my wing. I need her. I just want her because I was really smart, but I still had a, a little bit more to learn in the, the um, in, in teaching. I still, my mom was a teacher. I'm a natural teacher and I'm an excellent teacher, to be honest, especially classroom management. Um, but this was a language. I had to understand the language and how to do the lesson plans with that language and lesson planning and all that stuff. So while I watched my mom do it my whole life and she could help me, um, I uh, needed to learn it on my own. I did it. That woman ended up literally driving me insane, like almost literally. So I got my mom after me because she's jealous of me. Then I got this new person after me. And my mom used to always talk about how supervisors used to be after her when she was teaching. Now I get it. She used to always talk about people being jealous of her because she was beautiful. She had a great body. Now I get it. I just thought she was talking and she was just like, yeah, mom. You know, because she, she was always the victim. My sister and I used to say she always did. She always colored herself as being perfect and how she was a victim. Now that I look back, because now I'm trying to understand her better, um, she, was, she had a lot of issues. And I don't know where they started, but she just really had a lot going on inside. And... What a shame that her life turned it out to be where it is now. And But she did bring a lot of darkness into her life, okay, through the voodoo and things like that, starting with voodoo, which is de demonic. So um, basically, this lady's after me, like for real. She just switched on me because guess what? The kids started loving me. As soon as I walked in, this lady said, you just have some presence about you. I was like, maybe you shouldn't say that in front of my boss. She hated it. She went after me, literally every day that I was there. I had my Bible on my desk. Remember, I'm saved, but I didn't get sold out yet, okay? But this is the thing, guys. Even though you're not sold out, you have God living inside of you, and darkness sees it. They see it. My mom knew it. Why didn't she teach me to do voodoo? How come she didn't raise me? She tried one day to tell me about passing a torch once she was talking about, and she was talking about the prophet in this book, and I was like, okay, I was just listening, and I used to have great conversations with her. She loved me, but that was it. I wondered if she saw that I was not going to take it on. I wasn't going to do it. You know, I don't know. She just never got deep into it. But she did raise us to believe that we can go to that. And I remember going to a fortune teller one day thinking that I was going to take this darkness over my, off of my family because my mom taught us that that was normal. Then I find out, oh my gosh, I didn't know it was a fortune teller, first of all. I didn't know that. I thought it was a Christian lady. I, thought, I didn't know Catholic Catholicism was different from, from the... The, uh, my faith. So this lady seemed like a spiritual girl, lady that was Christian. I kept asking her, you Christian, right? And it turns out later she was just a fortune teller. I didn't know that. But she was this Christian woman and she was going to help pray off darkness from my family. That's what I wanted, pray off the darkness because obviously this darkness. I found out later she was just a typical fortune telling these people, they're liars. And if somebody's telling you they're, they're Christian and they're helping you take off demons and stuff, if they're demonic, they can't get rid of demons. Later, my mom was one, believe it or not, who tells me, excuse me, that that's what that was. I didn't even know it at the time because they're sneaky. So be careful with that. But why did I think it was okay? Because I grew up in a home where she, she had candles and said, sometimes you need a little help. She used to do that stuff. So how do you know? You know, and you don't know what you don't know. So that brings me to something I'm going to tell you about later. So in while I'm there, this lady, her email is her name 666 is me. I couldn't believe this lady's email was that. So you can tell by, I mean, come on. She was definitely demonic 
and she saw my Bible at the table. She probably knew my spirit. She probably, I, what I believe is that she knew me more than I knew myself. I did not know I had such a bright light of the Lord in me. I was trying to hide it with the long weave, being sexy, being cute and pretty, and just hiding. And then in my private home, I'd be tearing to the Lord, crying out to the Lord. It was private. I grew up in New York City, where it's like, it's not cool to be nice and to be sweet and to be godly. People will walk all over you. So I hid that. And so... I'm married to a husband that loved that sexy girl, that pretty girl that I had out here. And then one day, I, um, that lady had done that so much that I had burnout. And it, there's more to the story, but I got burnout. I ended up having to leave and just stop it all. And I actually got depression and burnout. It was really awful. And I had had that before in high school when my mother was using drugs. That was de so devastating to me that that affected me. So anyway, so... It ha that was the third time that I had had something like a burnout happen to me because of all this toxic people in my life. And I had pulled myself out of it. But this time was different. I couldn't pull out of this. I went to run to my mom for this because I had done it before. And it was different. Um, she looked like she was my friend, but she wasn't. And I, my eyes were starting to open, but I was still not well because I was burnt out because it was going on. What happened in the job went on for like months. It went on from September to now we're going into the spring. It was 2014, 2004, I think. I had a baby at home. I was supposed to be nursing. I had two children at home. My husband wanted everything to be on me. I was the person that was like a workhorse. I felt like he was whipping me with the thing, making me work. And I had agreed to it as this young girl. So I was burnt, I was tired. But then I would say to the doctor, I was like, I can't be tired. I can't stop. They need me. My whole family needs me. My husband needs me. I was doing everything. Everything, literally. Making all the decisions. I was the man of the house. Everything. And I went to this church where these ladies said, you should not be lead the leader of your home. The man should be. You should. And I just knew something wasn't right. Then I started Mary Kay. And I remember Mary Kay saying, God, first family, second career, third. And I said, my life is all over the place. I wish I could do that. That's when I set out to really put God first, family, second, career, third. So skipping from that awful experience of the burnout and the depression that came with it, I'm going to tell you guys, it was a living hell. I would never wish that on my worst enemy, what I went through. It was like a living hell, okay, what I went through. I don't think that was regular burnout and depression. I had a woman at my school that was after me spiritually i had my mom after me spiritually my husband's mom hated me i don't know what was going on with her but she hated me because i was black because i wasn't republican and i wasn't catholic she didn't like that i grew up democrat african-american 70s 80s come on think about that but anyway she hated that about me and so i had her after me my husband was starting to get after me because well, he wasn't yet, but he, was, he wasn't really what he should be because he wasn't saved. So he was taking advantage of me being calmer and quieter and not able to be as strong as I used to be. And he just wasn't treating me right. He was cursing me out and doing things that were that just mean. And I think it was always a little bit like that, but I thought it was just this Brooklyn hard edge. But then I saw my father came back in the picture and he was going through his um, 12 steps and he was asking for forgiveness and he's sober today for 20 something years praise the lord hallelujah i'm so proud of you dad and um while my mom actually stayed in denial and i i saw a tyler Perry movie where there was something called binging and i think that's what she was doing i think she would look fine but then months later she would get back into using the drug and then she would be fine and so in our minds because we were in, in lying to ourselves so we can make my mom perfect my sisters i believe still do that today i, I believe I'm not sure what they're doing today, to be honest. But I know I left them like that uh, 10 years ago when we stopped talking. And she just kept the facade going of what she wanted everybody to believe. And I told her, Mom, you need to be honest because then you can be healed from it. And there was another time when we took her to a place where the people told us, you know, it, it changes your brain waves and it, sh it changes your actual physical brain when you use this drugs, these drugs. And they warned the family that this could give you um, Alzheimer's and dementia and problems later and look what happened to my mom between being beat and having that look where she is today she has early dementia and I think that's hereditary I believe it's in our family but they I don't think that it started so young as her so she's had a really rough life so pray for my mom please um, but my father is has remarried 
and he had this new life and he was at a stage where he was being honest he was coming after us my sister didn't want to talk to him and i didn't want to and then i had this dream i i, I went to bed and woke up in sweats with the lord just overwhelming me saying go talk to your father it was just amazing I, oh i thought he died in my dream and the holy spirit just overwhelmed me that you need to love him and treat him right no matter what and i did and um, from that moment on, I respected him, I loved him, and I accepted his apology and started a relationship, but I made sure that he apologized for the things that hurt me. And we started this honest relationship, and at that time, he was the one that was there for me. And he, when I pulled out of that awful time, there was, I remember a day I watched Christian TV shows, I prayed all the time, I had my little baby with me, Rocco, and he would go with me to breakfast, and he was so sweet, he was always right there, he was doing his drawing, he was just a sweetheart, always right there, patient, I couldn't be what I wanted to be at that moment I was more animated but he didn't care I was just sitting with him and I just did minimal things we gone on the swing and I just had to slow everything down one day I was praying and praying and praying and praying and it broke one day and I saw this brightness and he said go to your a friend down the block and I did I started this new relationship with this friend and she was just somebody to talk to every day and then things started getting better and then I joined Mary Kay I was in Mary Kay before I, that happened when I left teaching, but then I got back into my Mary Kay. I went to some meetings and I met my director who said, um, never be afraid of your light because part of my feeling that way was everybody was mad at me because I was beautiful, smart, talented, and they were all beating me down for it. Everybody, even my husband. So I was surrounded by toxic people. I was surrounded by toxic people and didn't know it. And I was making it look like it was me. And that's why I was like, I didn't want to die, but I think subconsciously I was trying to quiet my goodness, my greatness. I don't know. You cannot hide your light when you've received Jesus as your savior. You can't hide your light. Even before you've sold out, know that you have a light. People see your light. My whole life, my mom saw it. They all see your light. You need to know what your light is. And I needed to know that lady at that place she knew what I was before I knew what I was. And that's what happened. I didn't have my ammunition to fight her at that job when I was teaching. I didn't know how to hone in on what I had inside of me. So I woke up one day and I was never the same. And I set out, something happened. And I, yes, I had to take um, Zoloft, I think it was, for four months. And I don't believe in drugs, remember? But I kept getting worse because I didn't want to take any drugs. I hated drugs. But it was actually hurting me at that point that I hated drugs. Because it took me for a long time to get going as a catch-22. I had to do some stuff to work on the physical of what was going on chemically so that I can have my brain together so I can get myself out. And so I did. And then I weaned in, in four days. I told the doctor, I was like, I, I think I'm going to stop. So I weaned off in four days and he wasn't happy, but I did. And then I started eating well and taking care of myself and I was still watching Christian TV shows. I was like pumping myself up with Christian TV shows. This was around the time of Katrina. I remember because I couldn't really care about it like everybody else because I was going through something myself, my own Katrina. I was going through an internal Katrina while Katrina was going on. So I noticed the whole world was going through this sadness about Katrina and how they were being treated. And I just felt like, oh my gosh, these people are going through what I'm going through right now. Like, I'm going through this Katrina right now. And then I was coming out of it around then. And then I was never the same because I, because let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. That was not depression. And that was not burnout. Someone did something spiritual against me. And I don't even think it was one person. My boss... My, my boss at the time, I know, was after me. And the whole school knew it. They had to move me. They had to hide me in the school. The whole school knew it. Okay? So I'm not making it up. And all the kids were loving me. She hated it. The kids wanted me to dance with them. I did this dance thing. They, she hated it. She was the queen bee and I came in and I was bad. I think that's what happened to my mom too. I think I was taking the attention from the queen bees and the queen bees were mad. I think my husband. So it's like this presence that God gave me that I can't. What am I supposed to do about it? And when my director, that is my director now, that's why she's my director, Mary Kay, she said, she was on stage and she was a national and she said, never be afraid of your light. That changed my life forever. That was a, that was a physical and psychological pivotal moment. Really big moment. I had never been the same. Then I went to some other things and I read some books, um, Permission to Succeed. Um, then I, and it was, it was all Mary Kay meetings. Okay, because this is all I had and they pumped me up with all this stuff. When I would come back from the meetings, my husband was mean to me, nasty. Whenever I went to counseling, he was cursing me out on my way to counseling. Okay, um, it was awful, but I couldn't do anything because I was 
trying to survive. I was in survival mode. Then I remember in counseling with this young girl, I was still in this psychological thing complaining about my mom. My mom doesn't love me. My mom, it's not fair. She doesn't love me. She doesn't treat me right. So one day she said, but what if she never changes? Click. My brain said, that's one thing about me. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I can't, the problem with me being insane is that I can't do the same thing expecting a different outcome. So when she said that, I said, you're right. I can't keep doing this forever because you may, may never love me. Never show it. So I better stop now just in case. Sure enough, it never did change. And she never did change. She just got sick. Now she just can't do anything now to do anything about it. But um, there was a time when I begged for apology so much that I got somewhat of an apology from her. And I started a new relationship saying, I'll call you when I when the Lord leads me to. And I started to set something called boundaries. This is what happened. Then I had to tackle the, the demon right in my home, my husband. And I said to myself, I somehow, in that time, I must have said prayers to the Lord saying, if you pull me out of this. But when I was in that, I felt like I'm not worthy. The devil died, lied to me saying, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. And I knew the Lord was going to do something with me, but I felt like it was over. I felt like, what could I possibly contribute to the world in this state where I am now? But the, everything I was watching on the Christian channels was telling me that God is, you know, Joyce Myers was amazing and all that. I knew in my spiritual self that I was meant for something, but the enemy was trying to tell me, look at you, what could you do? When I came out of that, I felt the Holy Spirit break loose. And I bet you whoever was doing whatever dark voodoo or whatever on me, they got it back because it broke. I felt the break. I came out a brand new person. I have never been the same. And I said to myself, I could never, people say, when you're in a bad experience, you're gonna be grateful later. It, I, I came out of it thinking, how could I ever be grateful for that? I felt like I was in a living hell. Hell. I've been through a lot. Anybody watching me that knows me knows, they know the little bits that they know that I've been through. I'm talking about a living hell. Hell. Mental torture. It was just torture. It was horrible. And I knew that if God brought me out of that, he was real. I knew it. There's no way. I was supposed to come out of that. And I came out of that. I came out of that pressed like a diamond. I have never been the same. I was sold out when I came out. I said, your will, Lord, not mine. I will never live for myself again. And I have not ever since. And it has been a journey. And the first thing I did was I tried to deal with the dark, toxic person that was living, sleeping in the same bed as me, which was my husband. And all of his family and all of my family. So think about that. Everybody in my life was toxic except for my two little children. I remember when I wasn't well, I went to see my mom and she was screaming at me while I wasn't feeling well. My husband took my money and bought a car and tried to turn my daughter against me and told her, look, your mom does, isn't happy that I bought her a car. She doesn't understand what was going on. He took my income tax and bought her, you know, things like that. Toxic people all around me. That's just the piece of what people really have done. Okay, they would tell me kind things in private, but then in public they would help with the, that mean. Back at the ranch, I have in-laws coming after me because they didn't like me because they didn't like understand my faith. They didn't understand Christian. They didn't understand my Christian faith. They didn't get it. They treated me like I was a whole nother religion. Later on, I found out that we are different. You know, born again believers. So, I stood strong after that, even against my husband, and I said I'm not gonna be that workhorse. I'm doing everything for the Lord, whatever he wants, however he wants me to walk, whatever he wants me to say, wherever he wants me to live, if he wants me to be married or not, I don't care. Whatever the Lord tells me, I will do. It started then. And guess what? My husband didn't like me from that moment on. He said, you've changed. You're not the same woman anymore. And our marriage started to go like this. And he ended up I tried to stay, I tried to take care of him, I tried to be with him. He ended up having the very thing I went through and didn't make it out of it. Did he wish it on me? I don't know, I don't know. But people who ended up hurting, they ended up having the things that I had and they didn't make it out of it. I don't understand. And he was missing for a year and a half, for a year and eight months. So I had a missing husband, that's the other chapter of my life. So, but leading up to that, my mother and him she was trying to get to him because he was so mean to me. And then he started to mess with the children. I found out that I didn't marry a drunk that was beating a woman. I married a dry drunk, apparently, that is verbally and emotional abusive. Who knew? So I had um, invisible of the two things that I didn't want. 
So I ended up getting it anyway, even though I set out not to have it. His father was an alcoholic and he picked up his ways. So I was with an alcoholic. He had tendencies of an alcoholic, which I didn't realize. And he was verbally and emotionally abusive. Who's ever heard of that? I didn't know that existed. Guess who taught me? My father. My father told me, you're, I said, I don't know what's wrong. I'm, I, feel mental, like, I feel like I'm in mental torture. He just drove me crazy. I didn't understand what was going on. He says, you're being emotion, verbally and emotionally abused. It's a thing. I was like, what? Started learning books about it. Tried to get him help. I stood up for myself. It went, it went on for a while. And then we, I said, I'm going where I can, I started taking care of my mind. I would, have not been an overachiever. I said, me first, I'm God first, me and family second, career third. And I really did it. I set out to really balance my life out right. My best friend, Wendy, who was there through this whole thing, she's the witness through all of this and more, my best friend, Wendy, that I met in college. She said something to me when I got out of that whole thing. She says, the thing is you need balance. Bing, there were some things that just like clicked. That was it, that was what I was missing. The other thing is, she's, I said, I just feel like, you know, I just didn't feel worthy. I felt horrible, so if you're around toxic people, you probably feel awful. She says, no, if you really think about it, Patrice, those are just 10 people, you're wonderful. I think if you just started with new people, they would see it too. Bing, I had to believe that. Wendy had always loved me and did not, share in any of these people's ways of thinking about me. Aunt Van never saw these things. I thought, well, are there more people out there in the world that could see me for who I am? Like you guys? So I set out to do that. My husband had not, I had to get protective order against him. He did things that wasn't right. He was doing silly things to my son and my children and it, finally it was over. And he ran away. It's a long story. I can tell you that whole story later. He left his family and was missing March 6th of 2009. And we haven't seen him since. And I ended up moving. I, had, I lost my home because he was, it was in his name. Um, I ended up, the Lord had told me already to stop teaching because I started teaching again. I went back on the horse and it was great. I had never had burnout, depression, nothing. Because guess what I learned? I got rid of toxic people. So I got rid of the toxic people. I set out to see these people. Wendy said we're out there that would see me for who I am. And what happens, I ended up having my own life in my own terms. And what I did, this is the takeaway, okay, guys? This is the takeaway, so pay attention. You get rid of toxic people. I learned about boundaries, setting boundaries, making sure that people aren't toxic. I set out to meet people who saw me before I was, mirrored who I am. That was a book I read, Permission to Succeed, by, I forgot his name, but I can find it. I don't even know if he's around anymore. I did things to feed my soul, and this is the thing. I re-raised myself. From the moment I met my husband, I set out to re-raise myself. And now I know the only way to do that is to receive Jesus as your savior, to be born again, because you're born of a baby. From there, you have to re-raise yourself. You don't bring that toxic stuff into this new life as a believer. They saw me as a new believer when I didn't see myself as a new believer. I had to see what was in me. I was powerful in the spirit of the Lord before I even knew I was powerful. Later on, I ended up being, I lost that home, which was a blessing. I ended up getting into an apartment where I was probably the most, the happiest time of my life. I felt so beautiful inside and out. I had my little kids. We had a little pool. We had fun. Every person I met, Wendy was right. They saw me. They were like, oh, you're such a, this one guy was mean to me once. And I said something, okay, God bless you. Later on, he stopped me and said, you know what? You're just such a wonderful woman. Thank you for not being mean to me. I'm sorry for screaming at you. That's just one. God was in miracle after miracle after miracle. God was just blessing me. And I was in hiding from my family because at that point, my family was out to get me. But they had tried to get my husband. The last person my husband saw was my mother before he died. My mother was dark. She was like this dark person she was I apparently my mom was beginning to get dementia uh, symptoms but my sisters were keeping her secret they were keeping my mother's lie alive and we just kept this we just started to not get along there was a lot of bad things that happened but in a nutshell they tried to they saw my husband was being mean to me and they tried to turn him against me and he used it in the end when he needed it and it hurt him he was missing and we and one day I sat with my kids and said we have to pray for your father I can't pay the bills everyone in my family knew 
that I was out there with my two little babies alone and no one helped me. None of my sisters, none of my uncles and aunts. I ran, I reached out to one of my uncles. He sent me $300. I He's a sweetheart. Um, I think he's suffering with dementia too. God bless him. Please pray for my uncles. And um, my other uncle passed away and it's just you know, dark, dark, dark. Then I couldn't speak. There was a time when I was with my kids where I couldn't pay the bills by myself. I couldn't speak. I had a friend. God sent me a best friend then. She helped me to, and I got my operation. I said, Lord, I'll sing for you if you ever let me speak again. I'm scared to sing. Pray for me. I will sing, but you guys have to be patient with me because it's not like my dancing. It's something I'm doing for the Lord, okay? So I will sing for him, but now I have my voice back, and it's been the best it's ever been. Uh, my poor babies have been through all of this. They have been through all of this. They are prayer warriors, these two kids. They are unusual children because they know the Lord through prayer. And they were raised with knowing when things go wrong, you pray and God breaks it and they saw it happen. They saw mommy sharing the gospel with multiple people coming to the Lord. They they know how to share the gospel. That's what we've done us. I went to Narraway, this uh, place where we were able to be in a play, the kids and I. It was like therapy for us when we didn't have my husband. And we re-raised ourselves in Narraway. We saw what courtship was all about. And I believed in not having sex to marriage. And I said, I'm going to do it the right way with my kids. If I get married again, I'm not going to have sex before marriage. And I want my kids to learn it. And these kids were homeschooled. And they all were, I learned what courtship was. I didn't understand it. But I knew I knew I wanted something like that. So when I saw it, these people were sold out for the Lord. I love them. They were my, they don't know it. But they were part of my re-raising myself. They helped me re-raise myself as I was raising my children. And my daughter is married to a born a godly man that is sold out for the Lord and no sex before marriage. It was a little easier because they had a long distance relationship, but I stayed with her before they got married. I'm hoping the same for my son. And um, I've re-raised myself. And that's my uh, that's my testimony. And uh, the first time someone asked me about my testimony, then you know we got hurt again because another man came in our lives, claiming to be saved, and he ended up not being saved. So that marriage lasted a year. It brought me to um, Winston in North Carolina, where I started my soccer program, and he was just awful, evil, and in that. Our spirits just clashed because he had a darkness. I will, till today, I know there was some kind of demon spirit going on with him too, because now I know what it is. I know how to push. I know how to pray off demon spirits now because I think that's what was on me. And God told me during that time that I had the gift of healing. So now I pray over people and people are healed. I do like my grandmother. I actually am carrying her torch. I do what my grandmother did. People used to come to her and she was to pray for healing and demons would be all for them and everything. I do that now. I can pray that off because of what I've been through, I guess. And I pray for people's healings. And a lot of women have uh, have conceived who couldn't. People have been healed from things. And this is the Holy Spirit in me, the Lord, their faith in mind. If it's God's will, if it's not God's will, then then all I can do is pray the devil off. And the, the Lord gives you what he wants you to have because there's something he wants you to learn from it. I've learned, met a lot of wonderful people. Wendy was right. My best friend Wendy was right. There are more people out here that can see me for me. You're them. My lovelies, thank you for loving me for me and thank you for asking that question. I went online, Natch.com, looking for love once I was away, finished with that marriage. I knew I wanted love and there was a guy that sent me a message saying, what is your testimony? That just like touched my heart and I said, this guy gets it. That's a deep question. That question, only somebody who knows what he knows can answer that question. And today he says that that was his litmus test. That's how he knew a girl was really saved. I was so excited to tell my testimony. I couldn't wait to tell him my testimony. And I said, you don't want to be with me. I was a lot of Christian guys didn't want to be with you if you were separated or you were divorced or whatever. This guy was wonderful. That's my husband today, Jeff. And that was the first time someone asked me for my testimony. And he wanted to know when I, that I was saved and I, was, I had the Lord in my life. And we waited for marriage for sex. We... Um, Put on our we had our purity rings and um we went i think it was uh, almost a year that we were courting and we got married and uh we've been together and my i'm full of people who see me for me i don't allow toxic people in my life and i'm here to make sure you don't either please take the story and don't allow toxic people in your life even if it's your husband your mother your children it doesn't matter who it is it can make you sick and the devil can tear you apart and i wouldn't be able to be a blessing to you had i allowed toxic people to this day i don't care who they are i don't allow toxic people in my life i set boundaries 
and I, I am now cordial with my father when I can because he's not in that truthful place these days. As he gets older, he's making excuses for my mom. He's making excuses for himself to me and he's not he's hot or cold and he's not consistent but he for the most part is better than everybody else my sisters are sneaky and they don't won't tell me where my mom is she's in a home now and they won't give me her telephone number and they're just sneaky and they just are acting really weird i try to love them and they just don't want it so there's no relationship with my sisters and me i miss my nieces and nephews they all will love me and i love them too they see me but look what they they have to re-raise themselves if they want to be with me so today the day my sisters are really saved sanctified filled with the holy spirit we will know right right because the lord didn't let me turn my back on my father who who deserved it in the flesh i did nothing to deserve it and my family has turned their back on me so that's just of the enemy so that's my testimony and that's why it was so hard to tell you it it took over an hour to do that so i hope that helped someone and um if you want me to give you more help on this i'm beginning to do um a a, a a subscription of $9.99 a month where you can go on and do workouts and everything and on there I'm gonna start doing things that help people more in depth with things like this it's going to just be for the people and all that YouTube isn't a place for that really but I'm gonna go in depth with those kinds of things so um, it's soccer core fit I'll put the links below and all that kind of stuff so that's where I can get in depth I had a spiritual channel where I talked more about it but I think that might be the best way to do it because then you can just you can watch it on your phone you can do things with it there and it could be fitness uh, belly dance fitness and it could be stretch and meditation prayer for healing and anything like this if you want to know more about getting a toxic people out of your life and all that kind of stuff I could do small videos here and go into depth and I can answer questions do more in detail things there and courses and stuff like that but if you've made it to the end of this video the first step is receiving Jesus as your Savior this is my Easter message it's my life story um, I thank you for letting me be candid um, if you use it against me it doesn't matter because my sins are a nail to the cross and um, we true believers we don't live in the same kind of realm as everybody else we know that we are saved sanctified filled with the holy spirit and we're covered with the blood of jesus he never came to condemn so if any human tries to condemn me it doesn't really affect me kind of like i'm i've got like this thing around me and if you truly read the bible and you know the lord then it, it, there is no place for that really there's only a place for edification and loving one another i'm trying to do what i told my mom to do be honest about what, what i went through so i can bless someone else i don't want to live a lie like she did and i don't want people to cover my story like my sisters are doing to i don't even know what they're doing now my mom's not even able to do anything so i think they're carrying the torch it, be, it may be possible that they're still carrying on the voodoo themselves now I don't know what happened within the last 10 years but I just know what I was left with and I can just put pieces together and I know what my spirit tells me so I don't trust them and they're not in my life and they've told me that they don't love me at all but my nieces and nephews I absolutely adore I miss and I love them and and I wish that I could be close to them so pray for my family um, if you say the song and you don't know Jesus please repeat after me this is the best time to do it Easter okay so repeat after me Jesus forgive me of my sins I turn from my ways I want to live your way I believe that you lived on this earth I believe you died on that cross just for me if I was the only person in the world it would be me that you died for Thank you. I received that love from you. I believe you unlocked the keys to hell. And on the third day, you rose from the dead. And that's what we celebrate today, Easter. I believe that. I believe the story of Easter. I believe you're alive today at the right hand of God the Father. Please come in my heart and be my Lord and Savior so I can live forever with you in heaven. Amen. If you said that prayer, really, today's your day you've been born again. You said you would give him, you would let him live in your heart and live turn from your ways. Now the turn thing is to do it. You heard my story. It took all of that for me to do it. I've had only joy and peace. I've had no, I've had a missing husband and all those things. Not one ounce of depression, not one ounce of burnout, 
nothing. Because the demon spirit that was covering me through those toxic people, I don't have toxic people in my life. And if they are, I pray them away. Keep toxic people out of your life so that the Lord can speak to you and you can be everything God wants you to be. That's the message for today. Keep balance in your life and re-raise yourself. Once you've received Jesus as your Savior, now you're a baby in Christ. It's your job to re-raise yourself. What does that mean in biblical terms? Renew your mind. Re-raise that mind. Get that toxic stuff out of there. If you were raised with toxic people, guess what you know? Toxic things. You want to have sex all the time. You probably want to use drugs. You probably want to do everything all those toxic people. You were raised with that. That's all you know. Renew that mind. That's what he means by that. Put your body and yourself in place where you want to be like those people. You want families like that. You want marriages like that. That's what the narrow way place was for me. By the way, that's in, in uh, South Carolina near Carowinds, narrow way. Visit that place. They're amazing. Okay. I, me and my children, my children and I, we performed there for a year straight and it was our counseling. It was our therapy as our, as our, my husband and their father was missing. They were my strength. They were my, my church and my heart and my, my people. I went to church, but they were the ones that were with us and they kept us busy and it was psychologically. God said, go into your performing arts. He told me to do a tape. He told me to do soccer. Like that's what I've been doing since obeying the Lord, living in an obedient state. If you are saved, but you have not been born again, I mean, you have not been, um, you have not, uh, sold out for the Lord or completely had that turnaround, that pitiful little moment like me. I don't want you to have it like I did. Look what it took. What that tells me is I must have been hard-headed for God to have to let me go through that. It was awful, guys. Don't go through that. Tell him today. Repeat after me with this prayer. If you say, but you want to be sold out for the Lord and you don't care what you're going to lose. I lost a lot, but he rebuilt me. I have an amazing saved husband that's just, he's just, Jeff is just, such a sweetheart. He's a gift from the Lord. He tells me every day I'm his treasure. He's my treasure. What a wonderful husband after all I've been through. I am, I have a heaven, a joyful life now. My children don't have to deal with that. They, they don't have a lot of sisters, aunts and aunts around them, but they have that. Say this prayer. Jesus, I want to rededicate myself to you. I believe in you. I believe in the Trinity and that you've lived and died and rose the third day. I've already received you, but I want to rededicate myself today. I'm ready to truly do what I promised, what I set out to do when I received you as my Lord and Savior. Give me the courage to do it, Lord. I know I'm going to lose things. Give me that peace in my heart that surpasses all understanding, the courage and the faith to walk and the ability to walk out on faith and do everything you tell me to do. Please, Lord, let me find the right people, the right people that will support me. I need you, Lord, and I'm ready to be sold out for you. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you very much. Thank you for staying and listening this long. Share it with somebody that you think could be um, uplifted and encouraged. And I'll see you in the next video. God bless you. Bye.